Good evening to everyone joining our webinar tonight. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes to join the event here, and then we'll get started with Melinda Myers. So welcome to Fall Landscape and Garden Care. So again, we'll just give everyone a couple minutes to join the event here, and then we'll get started. I'm seeing lots of folks coming in the event here. We'll get started in just a moment. And if you registered earlier than an hour ago, you should have received the handout in your email. Um, that handout is what Melinda will be going over this evening. And we'll also send it out again following the presentation. And we'll also send out the link to that handout in our chat function here during the webinar tonight. So, um, can access it at any point during our presentation. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So hello and welcome to Fall Landscape and Garden Care. My name is Kelly Bolter, the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. And it is our great pleasure to welcome back Melinda Myers for uh, another wonderful workshop. Um, in the background is also Beth, our adult services librarian at East Branch Library. Beth will be monitoring the chat and sending that handout link a few times during our presentation tonight. So during the presentation, you'll notice that your uh, microphones are turned off, but uh, please feel free to chat with each other in that chat function. You'll see the button at the bottom of your screen. We'll also have time at the end of the presentation for uh, your questions for Melinda. So during the presentation, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A. You'll see that Q&A button right next to the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Melinda. Thank you so much for uh, being here tonight. Thank you, Kelly. And as always, I like to thank everyone responsible for supporting this webinar and my work with Milwaukee Public Library. First, Milwaukee Metro Sewage District and Fresh Coast Guardians. We work together to help you find ways to keep water on your landscape so we don't overflow the storm sewer. So they're supporting this webinar. Milwaukee Public Library, Kelly and Beth, who always make it easy for me to get out to you via webinars or whatever. So I really appreciate their support. If you haven't been to your local library, do so. It's chock full of great resources um, on this topic and many more. So let's get started. One of the things we wanna make sure we do is to continue to water as needed throughout the fall. Sometimes as the weather gets cooler or the garden season winds down, depending on where you live, for some of you, you're changing out to your winter garden. For some of us, we've got a little bit of time for fall display and then it's winter. But we wanna make sure our plants are well hydrated before the ground freezes or before things get a little drier in the winter and where you live. Now, all plants are important, but we want to put as a priority new plantings. Like you see on the left here, this was a new magnolia I'd planted for my daughter years ago. So you want to make sure those new plantings receive sufficient moisture. It takes several years for tree shrubs and perennials to become established. Moisture lovers like the birch in the center of the screen, this happens to be river birch, paper bark birch, many of our moisture lovers, they need to be a high priority. And of course, evergreens, because evergreens continue to lose moisture through their needles or the broadleaf evergreens through their leaves, even though the roots are frozen if you live in the north. So making sure all our plants, but especially these are well watered before the ground freezes. And you want to water when the temperatures in the air and soil are 40 degrees or above. So you want to water when it's a little bit warmer as those temperatures get cooler so that the water has time to soak into the ground. Even established trees and shrubs need water. Uh, this summer for many of us, it was hot and dry, and it's so easy to overlook our established trees. And unfortunately, drought effect shows up later, whether it's just from a dry fall and winter or from a hot, dry summer beforehand, it stresses those plants and they're more subject to insects and disease. You know, after a summer drought, I watch our trees and shrubs for signs of boars and other stressing insects that tend to attack 
attack under stressful situations. So make sure established trees and shrubs are well watered. A soaker hose like this is a great way to apply water throughout that area under the canopy. Trees need 10 gallons of water for every inch diameter of trunk. And so that's a lot of water that you need to apply to the ground. And that ensures that you're watering that root zone because the majority of the feeder roots are in the top 12 to 18 inches for our trees. So carefully, you know, pull back the mulch, dig down four to six inches, feel the soil if it's crumbly and starting to dry, it's time to water. Fall is a good time to mulch your trees, shrubs, and garden beds. You know, mulch is great. It conserves moisture. It moderates soil temperature. So when we have extreme heat, like many of us uh, suffered this summer, it helps keep those roots not only moist, but also cool, and also insulates them in the winter when we're using organic mulches, like shredded bark or wood chips, um, shredded leaves, or evergreen needles, or for my Southern friends, pine straw. Here you can see they edge the bed, and they put a two to three inch layer of wood chips. The coarser the mulch, the thicker the layer of wood chips. So for fine things like shredded leaves, you only need about an inch to use. Now leaves make a great mulch, as you can see here, and fall leaves are an excellent source. And I'll talk more about how to shred those leaves, collect those leaves and spread them as mulch. There's been some research and there's a link on your handout. And I think it was the Brooklyn Botanic Garden that's recommending putting shredded leaves or compost below wood chips or pine bark mulch because the leaves and the compost break down adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil faster than the wood chip mulch. So you're kind of getting a double benefit, a double layer of suppressing the weeds from your two layers of mulch, but also adding nutrients and organic matter to the soil quickly and then over the long term. So leaves, it's a free source of mulch. Now, the reason we want to mulch trees and shrubs is so that we protect them from mowers and weed whips. You know, mowing around this is a lot easier than if you have to go and take your weed whip or hand trim. Trees are very often injured. Um, a friend of mine who used to work for the city of Milwaukee Forestry said he could spot weed whip damage at 40 miles an hour because he could tell where the trunk was damaged. Those trees were stressed, suffered drought stress more, and really showed the stress. So expanding that ring makes your job easier. It also helps promote growth. Research has found that grass is a big competitor with young trees. And so if we can keep that grass away, the tree is going to grow much faster. When I was teaching um, horticulture at the Milwaukee Area Technical College, I did tree and shrub ID and we were walking around campus and I showed my students a catalpa tree and they all kind of laughed. They said it looks more like a shrub. It was pretty small. This was the spring of 1995 and any of you gardening that summer know it was a hot, dry summer. And so we expanded the mulch ring around that tree. Nobody watered during the hot, dry summer. That tree put on a foot of growth just by expanding that mulch ring and conserving moisture with the help of mulch. So you're doing good things for your tree by adding mulch. But don't do mulch volcanoes. These just pile, mulch piled around the trunk of the tree is bad for the tree because that trunk is designed to be exposed to light and air, not covered with mulch. Often what will also happen besides rot is the plant sends out adventitious roots that grow in a circle and girdle the trunk of the tree, eventually causing to decline in depth, so no mulch volcanoes. This is at my place. Um, this has been a few years ago. We had these three spruce trees and grass growing right underneath them, as you can see. And I really wanted to make it easier to cut the it's really grow and mow our sort of grass and weeds around it. But I wanted to support those trees. Um, Colorado blue spruce, not necessarily the best choice. These were um, Black Hill spruce, a little bit tougher, but I wanted to support them by um, putting some mulch underneath, but also making our job easier to maintain that area underneath. So I mowed around, you could see before that I mowed that area to kind of design the bed that I wanted to form. Then I edged the bed, it's a big bed, so I rented an edger from our local big box store. Um, you may just use a shovel if your bed is not that big, but I've decided equipment helps on these bigger projects. So I edged the bed, 
And the reason for edging is to keep the grass and the weeds from going from outside that mulch bed in because they're connected with rhizomes. So you want to make sure that they don't support the weeds and grass that you're trying to smother. So I cut the grass really short. We edge that bed. I lay down cardboard and covered that with uh, wood chips. Now, um, what I did is I covered that whole area. I saved uh, cardboard for months, covered it with chips, and I did not have to do much weeding for the next seven years. In fact, those trees have grown so big, they've grown together, and I've had to expand that mulch bed a couple of times because just conserving the moisture, suppressing the grass and weeds, those trees have taken off and are growing quite well. Here's what they look like when we finished. And that was quite a few years ago. And so, as I mentioned, well, I added a bed next to it, but I've also had to expand that mulch bed because the trees have done so well. Leave your healthy perennial, I always did. I call it winter interest. You know, I live in the North, so I don't have those beautiful crepe myrtles. I don't have camellias. We've got plants, seed pods and dry grasses and browned out leaves to go up against our evergreens and add winter interest. But those perennials also provide homes for many native bees and also pollinators and seeds for the birds. I don't know about you, but if I didn't have songbirds visiting my landscape during the winter, it would seem much less longer. So this picture was taken at the National Arboretum. Um, it's uh, New England Aster is the purple and Willow Amsonia is the amber color that you see there. Do cut back disease and insect or insect pest infested plants. So on the right is bee balm. And if you've grown bee balm, certain varieties of phlox, uh, peony, you've probably seen powdery mildew. It was bad this year in much of the country. Now, I often leave them standing because I like to leave the seeds for the birds. My plant pathology friends would say, cut it and get it out of there because then you have less source of disease for the next year. So you're going to want to make that call. It is better for plant health, a little bit fewer seeds, but if you're like me, there's probably plenty of other things for the birds to eat. On the left, we have a peony suffering from botrytis and phytophthora blight. And many of you may have had um, flux, uh, powdery mildew, I'm sorry, on your peony as well. So when they die back this fall, cut those and get rid of that diseased material. Cut back hostas if nematodes, you can see on the right, that's leaf foliar nematode damage or slugs, um, slug eggs over winter under hosta debris. So after they turn yellow and die back, cut those back so re you reduce the problems with those two pests. Cutting back iris, bearded iris. If you've had leaf spot like you see on this one or your iris had iris bore or you've had iris bore in the past, I should say, cutting back the leaf debris one reduces the source of uh, leaf spot disease for next year, but also removes the egg laying grounds for the iris borer. The iris borer is a day flying moth. He, it lays its eggs, I should say, she lays her eggs in the leaf litter of uh, bearded iris. They overwinter there. And then when the leaves are about six inches tall, the eggs hatch, the larva goes into that leaf, travels through the leaf, infest the rhizome, eats through that, and then it, it ends up letting soft rot through and it's a mess. When you find that dig, get, discard those uh, iris borer damaged or infested rhizomes, you could replant in the same spot. If they pupate, it just flood that area and collect the pupa. But remember the adults fly and they look for that leaf debris. And you'll be amazed, just doing a little fall cleanup will help reduce that problem. Vegetable debris, remove and, or, and or cut back. This is squash vine boar. Hopefully you didn't have it this year, but it overwinters. It's a day flying black and orange day flying moth lays its eggs at the base of your squash and squash plants. It, it hatches and then you can see this larva eats its way through the stem. You want to get that out of the garden because they do have eggs and they can overwinter in that debris. Tomatoes with leaf spot, anything that's diseased or insect infested, especially in the vegetable garden, get it out. 
But what do you do with that stuff, right? Most of us don't compost fast enough and hot enough to kill insects, insect pests, diseases, weed seeds. Now check with your municipality. Many will let you throw away disease and insect uh, pest infested plant material, but give them a call and find out because yard waste, landscape trimmings have been banned from landfills because it's a waste of landfill space, but we don't wanna pass along the problems to others. Some of the things you can bury, um, avoid soil-borne diseased material, things like verticillium wilt and fusarium wilt, you don't wanna bury that, but like powdery mildew, um, tar spot on maple, and preferably away from the area where those plants were infected, digging a hole, burying it and covering it with a few inches of disease-free, pest-free soil is one way to isolate. Um, burning obviously is an option, but that's a concern about air quality and many of us can't burn anyway. So looking for more environmentally friendly options, I think is a good thing for all of us to do. Now, I mentioned leaving perennial stand, but perhaps you are gonna cut them back and fall. One, maybe you decide you don't like the look of winter interest. That is a decision you could make. But remember, it does increase hardiness of your plants if you're trying to sell it on to whoever you uh, share your home and landscape with. So increasing hardiness, home for bees and beneficial insects, food for songbirds, winter interest um, are some of the benefits. But if you're cutting back disease or insect infested plant material, decide to cut back in fall. Um, for whatever reason, wait until the plants are dormant. So they're still putting lots of energy into their roots and we wanna make sure they're fueled up and ready to go next spring. Then cut back to two to three inches above the soil surface. Now, some perennials put on a rosette of leaves at the end of the season. Make sure you leave those intact if you're pruning back. Now, if you are waiting to cut back in spring, wait for temperatures to hover in the 50s. I used to say, oh, wait for that nice 40 degree day in March and go out and do your cleanup because there's not much else we can do in our gardens if you live in the north. Then I found out there's still a lot of insects hibernating in those hollow stems of many of our perennials. So we really want to wait for those spring temperatures to begin hovering in the 50s before we start the cleanup. Cut those stems back to 18 to 24 inches, and then you can take some right back to the ground. They found that many of our native bees use these old stems for summer homes. And so by leaving them, they're homes for many of the bees. The new growth will come up and mask these older stems. Over the next winter, they'll tend to die back and you won't even notice. They'll add organic matter and nutrients to the soil. So this is another change in habit. I'll tell you, every year I learn something new and I think we all are about how we can manage our landscapes with pollinators in mind. If you can't wait, how about pruning back and stacking out of sight? I was watching a webinar, I think it was from Penn State or Minnesota on uh, clean up with pollinators in mind. And what she was doing was bundling her stems even after she did her cleanup at the right time, bundled them and tucked them under her evergreens or under some other places to let them slowly decompose. I have enough room I could stack them out of sight and then midsummer I'll end up shredding them and using them as mulch or throwing them into the compost pile. I know that's more challenging as a small space gardener, but perhaps you can tuck them behind your foundation planting under your big evergreens or areas like that. So we've got our perennial garden set, either leaving it stand and then plans for cleaning up in the fall, in the spring, I'm sorry, once the temperatures are hovering in the 50s. But what about our grass? This is my friend Dorothy's yard and she has beautiful, amazing gardens. And um, caring for your lawn, fall is an important time. If you were only going to fertilize once, fall would be the time to do that. So those of us gardening in the north, a lot of our cool season grass are really hitting their stride. Those of you in warmer area, your warm season grasses still have some time to grow yet and benefit from fall care. 
mow high. You want to mow as high as possible. Those of us growing bluegrass and uh, fescues are mowing at about three and a half, four inches tall. The taller the grass, the deeper the roots. We want to mow often enough if possible to only remove a third of the total height. That's about an inch. And those clippings will break down quickly so we can leave them on the lawn. But you can see from this diet, this graphic that the shorter the grass, the shallower the roots, the more subject to drought, insect and disease problems that lawn, we're putting it under stress. And cutting it shorter doesn't mean you have to cut it less often. So raise that mower height. In fall, we can keep leaving our grass long. Some people choose to make that last cut a bit shorter. You can do that if you like, it's not necessary. Leave your grass clippings. If you do nothing but leave your grass clippings for a whole season, that's equal to one fertilization, one pound of nitrogen per year. You team that with one fall fertilization for most established lawns, that's all you need to do. And a lot of research is showing less effort is needed if we do some of these more eco-friendly things. Mow high, leave our clippings. Sharpen your blade, and yes, I know I need to clean my mower off here. Um, and what we do is we have several sets of blades. And usually when I say this to a group in person, everybody goes, we're supposed to sharpen our blades? Yes. A sharp blade means you're gonna mow faster so it'll take you less time to cut the grass. You'll use 22% less fuel. And if you're doing a push mower, it'll be a lot easier if those blades are sharp. And your lawn loses 30% less water. So it saves water, it saves fuel, and it saves your energy and time as well. So if you have a couple sets of blades, you can always have one sharp and ready to replace. We have a lot of rocks on our property, so we always are hitting some rocks. So we change our blades out several times during the growing season. Aerate if you need to. Aeration, core aeration pulls plugs of soil out, opening up the way for water and nutrients to go down to the root zone of the plants. Great if your soil is compacted. It also helps to cut through that thatch layer. So again, allowing that thatch to decompose. You don't have to aerate every year. This is if you need to. Fall is a great time, preferably at least six weeks before the lawn goes dormant, if possible. You can also aerate in the spring, but I find fall is a good time to do it. If the soil's moist, it's easier to pull those plugs. You can rent a, rent a core aerator, or you may choose to hire someone to do it. Um, if possible, if they can grind up those cores as they're pulling them out of the soil, that's even better. That helps speed up the decomposition so they break down faster. Otherwise, leaving them there, they'll eventually break down. Again, adding organic matter from the thatch layer in the grass and the soil back in. I've talked a little bit about fall fertilization already. As I mentioned, a lot of research has shown us that fall is the time to fertilize. For those of us growing cool season grasses, this is the time our lawn is starting to recover, so we need to give it some help. The hot, dry weather is hopefully winding down in the fall cool season grasses put down root growth and they spread more than top growth. So fertilizing, we get the benefit of promoting root growth and density rather than just producing more clippings. Um, those of you, and then those in cool season grasses, we also can do a second fertilization between Halloween and Thanksgiving before the ground freezes. Now with malorganite, it's a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. So whatever the lawn doesn't use, freezes in the soil for the winter, is there and available for your lawn in spring when the temperatures are right for the grass to be growing and the fertilizer to be available. Those of you in warm season, you want to make sure you stop at least six weeks before the first hard frost so that your lawns have time to harden off before cooler weather sets in. As you mow your lawn in the fall, mow over the leaves and leave them in place. They break down adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil. If you can see the grass blades for the leaf pieces, your lawn will be fine. If you leave whole leaves on top of your grass, they block the light. Also, those of us in cold climates, they can ice up. They don't make good insulators and kill the grass beneath. So just as you're mowing the lawn in fall, you're shredding those leaves. You don't need to rake them. 
and you take care of two problems in one, with one. And then always sweep grass clippings, fertilizers, any chemicals off the walks, the drives, and any hard surfaces, because that will be good for your lawn. It's bad for our waterways if we leave this debris on the hard surfaces, because when it rains, where does it go? It washes off into the curb, into the storm sewers, and into our waterway. That makes us spend more energy and time removing solids and nutrients to our waterways. It's bad for the water quality. So improve your lawn, sweep it back in where it belongs. And if you see your friends and neighbors sweeping it down the storm sewer, maybe remind them where their drinking water comes from. We can all work, do a little more to help improve our water quality. And speaking of not what not to rake into the street, I know as a small space gardener, I was one for 26 years and managing leaves is challenging, but avoid doing this. I know many municipalities encourage you to rake your debris to the curb, but here's what happens. So you rake it to the curb. It seems to always rain. So leaves end up plugging up the storm sewer. So the city has to send the street and sewer crew out to clean out the storm sewer where we don't want plant debris. Then we pay to have this, the sweeper come, the city to come and collect all those leaves, get hauled away, gets composted. Then we go and buy compost in a bag rather than making it ourselves or putting that great resource to use in your lawn. So as you get out the rake. Think about raking the leaves into your lawn, and we'll talk about other ways you can use it. Uh, leaves are not only good for our plants as they break down, adding organic matter and nutrients, but many organisms winter in the ground. Toads, frogs, queen bumblebees, bumblebee queens, some beneficial insects, either overwinter in the leaf litter or below ground. So the leaves provide added insulation. So think about that as you're raking those leaves, rake them into the garden beds where they can provide insulation for these wonderful organisms and members of our landscape. Um, you can reuse your leaves as well. Use them as mulch, as I mentioned before, either underneath your wood chips or as a mulch in itself. Um, I use it. I often will bag them, save them, and use them in my vegetable garden because they work great at suppressing the weeds. Or I'll put them in a pile out of the way, and then they're available near the garden to use as a mulch. Or use them around your perennials, trees, and shrubs. Shred your leaves and dig them into your annual flower beds or vacant gardens or if you're starting a new garden. If you're doing no-till, they make a great addition to no-till gardening methods. And check out my no-till blog on um, Melorganite's website. But otherwise, you can dig them into your garden soil, especially if you have heavy clay soil that's poorly drained or fast grain draining sandy soil. As they break down over winter, they add organic matter and nutrients and help improve the soil. So that's a great way to use them. Some people will put them on the soil surface, then just pull apart and, and plant in the spring or if you have a winter garden. Um, sometimes that keeps the soil pretty cool. So you're going to have to wait a little longer for the soil to warm up when you have a thick layer of mulch on the garden. Add them to your compost pile. Leaves are a great addition. They're high in carbon, and we'll talk about composting right now. So if you're not composting, this is a great time to get started. There's lots of material, all the raw materials you need to start composting. You can see my, this compost pile of mine. There's leaves in there, um, <clears throat> my kale. I'm not a big kale eater, so I grow it because it's pretty. So <clears throat> some of it ends up in the compost pile, rich in nitrogen. And so here are some things to keep in mind. You often hear the, the chant, equal parts of green and brown help the microbes break it down. And when this chant came out in the 80s, I had tons of calls going, what's green? Is this green? Is it brown? If you put your materials in a heap, they will eventually break down. The more effort and planning you do, the faster you get results. Here's some example of nitrogen-rich greens, manures, vegetable clippings, 
fresh vegetable clippings, fruit and vegetable kitchen scraps, um, herbicide-free grass clippings, seaweed and kelp. I heard somebody describe it as those moist, wet things tend to be greens, which is very true. Browns are carbon rich, and that includes things like coffee grounds, evergreen needles, corn stalks and corn cobs, fall leaves, which we'll all have a lot of us will have many of, non-glossy paper and cardboard. And so mixing those parts equal by volume, you get the, the nice mixture of, ni of nitrogen and carbon, so you get faster decomposition. But you know what? Put it in a heap, it will eventually decompose. Key is don't add these things. No bones, meat, fish, fat, or dairy. That brings in the rodents. Uh, disease and insect infested plant material. I mentioned earlier, most of us, our compost pile doesn't get hot enough to break those down. Perennial and invasive weeds, because the last thing you want to do is replant them in your garden um, when you're adding your compost. You took all that effort to get rid of them. Weeds gone to seed. Um, those seeds, again, usually don't break down in most of our compost piles. Charcoal ashes, you do not want to use grass clippings from the lawn that's recently been treated. So don't put these in your compost pile. Here's how you can create a layered pile. This is one way to speed up the process. So an eight to 10 inch layer of green and brown materials, cover that with a layer of compost and then sprinkle if you know me, malorganite or another organic fertilizer over that layer, repeat until your pile's at least three feet high and three feet wide. And so by creating that, what you're doing is you're putting the materials together in a form that they're going to break down quickly. The compost adds the microorganisms that we need to help break down the material. The fertilizer feeds the microorganisms, gives them that energy as they break it down. At the end, you will have more or more nutrients than you've added with the fertilizer. And a lot of people say to me, well, I don't have compost for my first pile. How about those annual containers? Dump those in. There's potting mix there. That's a good source of soil or organic matter. Um, compost bins, that's one way to hold things together. This is a homemade method. This is at Retzer Nature Preserve in Waukesha County for any of you in Southeast Wisconsin. They've got a wonderful display. One of the things I like about this, these are two by fours, hardware um, cloth um, bolted to the frame that they made, but they use eye hooks to hold the walls in place. So if you need to turn the compost pile, you can take that apart turn the pile and then put it back together. It makes it much easier. So once we've built our pile, we're gonna moisten it to the consistency of a damp sponge, let it heat up. And then after a few days, the heat, it starts cooling off. That's when we turn the less decomposed material from the outside to the inside and then more decomposed to the outside. A three bin method is a wonderful option because you can stockpile in one, build an active compost pile in the middle, and then turn it from the second to the third bin back and forth. And that way you're not adding new material that slows down the decomposition process. So again, one bin to stockpile, two to do your turning from one bin to the other. If you've ever turned a compost pile, you know you can skip your visit to the gym that day. It's a great workout. And if you have a bad back or just too tired, you might wanna try a tumbler. And many municipalities have restrictions on the type of compost bins you can use because of rodent issues. That's a reality of being in an urban and suburban area. So many of the tumblers are designed to not only contain the material, but keep out unwanted environments. Now, the other benefit of a tumbler as to turn it, you just turn the, the bin. And so it's a lot easier than using a garden fork and moving the pile. And if you select properly, you can get one that's easy to load and one that's easy to empty the finished compost into a wheelbarrow. But if you've done a tumbling, a tumbler bin, you may have complained to me, I've heard this from many, is it never seems to finish. And the problem is you're continually adding fresh material. So you get the pile started, you're turning, and then you add some more raw material and you turn. And so you've got 
raw material partially decomposed and fully decomposed. And so you either need to screen out the compost that's finished or keep composting. Having two bins or a dual bin system, this is from Gardener Supply, perfect for small urban areas. On one side, I stockpile. On the other side, I have an actively composting um, pile. And when it's finished, I empty that. That's where I stockpile and I get the one on the left started. So when we're using a tumbler, once we're ready to start composting, add some fertilizer, some compost or garden soil and moisten it, the consistency of a damp sponge if needed and start turning. Trench composting is another option. This is what I grew up with. Um, after dinner, my dad would send my brother or I outside with the greens from the green onions, any lettuce we didn't eat that wasn't good enough for the salad, rinds from the melons, and you dig a hole and bury the material. If possible, cover with at least eight inches of soil to help discourage animals from digging. I'm lucky my garden is fenced in so I can cheat a little bit, but I really do try to get it down deep enough because I want to discourage any of those ground squirrels that are in the garden from digging. So at least eight inches covered with at least eight inches of soil. And you may just dig a trench between your rows of garden, um, holes scattered throughout garden beds where space is available, and then just add your raw materials cover as you go. And it's a great way to dispose of those materials right away. You don't need a place to save them, just take a bucket out, bury them right away, and you've taken care of it. These will break down over winter, improving the soil, adding nutrients and organic matter. That my, this is a method I really like. Learned it from my friend, Ray Greiton, and Dawn, who helps me put together my talks, found this old image. Uh, this was some 38 years ago when I was pregnant with my daughter, and Ray and I did a video on vegetable gardening. He taught me so much about composting, growing vegetables. He raised seven crops of lettuce in a year in his uh, Milwaukee area garden, and so he taught me so many cool things. Now he spent lots of time in his garden. And so I promised him all he wanted in return for sharing his wisdom. And I always left with a bag of produce was passing all his ideas along to you. And so I said, I would be happy to do it, but that I would uh, have to kind of Belindaize it because most of us don't have 12 to 14 hours. But his this one method of his uh, this is one of many of his ideas. So his method, I call it the Greiton method, he would take a rake and he'd rake soil from, so he aligned his beds four feet wide and eight or 20 feet long. And he takes soil from half of that bed and half of that area and rake it in one direction from the path into the bed and from the path on the other side into the bed. So he takes soil, you can kind of see my garden here, the pathway sunken because I took the soil from the path, raked it into each of the garden beds, right? And so, and then I planted that raised bed and just the mere act of raising the soil improves drainage. You're going to just have to trust me on this. Otherwise, we have to do a soils lab lecture. So just trust me on this. Just raising the soil is going to help improve drainage. And then in the pathway, you can see I have raw material to the right. In that pathway, we're going to be throwing the outer leaves of lettuce, the things that aren't good enough to eat, our landscape trimmings. And we're going to, they're going to act as a mulch. They're going to suppress the weeds. They're going to conserve moisture. As we walk on them, we'll break them down. Then at the end of the season, we will rake the soil from half that raised bed over the path, half the raised bed on the other side, and let the material decompose. The path becomes next year's garden bed. The garden bed becomes next year's path. So we've rotated, planted, and compost in a relatively small area. And this is just a graphic um, Dawn, Dawn created to help you visualize. So we've got our pathways on either side of our raised bed. And then that's where we're doing our composting. And then next year, we're going to have our path, our raised bed be the path, and we'll be composting and planting.
So those are just some ways we can manage the landscape trimmings in our landscape. And I realize you need to find a method that not only fits the space, but also your schedule. The other thing we wanna do is be proactive. So those of you in areas with snow and ice storms, uh, want to prevent this kind of damage. Upright arborvitae and junipers, when the snow falls on them or freezing rain and ice, those multiple stems often bend over and sometimes are damaged. We don't want to get out there and shake off the snow and ice because sometimes we cause more damage than the good we do. So proactively take cotton strips um, and tie those upright stems together. I like using um, netting because it it's kind of somewhat invisible and that holds those stems upright. So when the snow piles up, it rolls off the top of the plant. Also protects those arborvitaes a bit from the deer as well. So proactively before snow season begins, anytime now, start tying up those upright stems, keep them together to avoid this problem. Prevent winter wind, and this goes even for our friends um, in the south, winter wind and sun damage, because uh, winter sun can be very drying. Evergreens are maybe losing moisture even when it's not available in the soil. So providing some shade, screening out the winter winds, typically coming from the north or northwest, depending on your particular landscape, the buildings and fencing around, monitor, see where the winds are coming from, a little decorative fencing. Depending on the planting, I've taken my Christmas trees and laid them in air strategically to provide wind breaks right next to a planting bed. Um, Decorative fencing, some people will put uh, burlap, camouflage fabric, other things to block the wind and provide a bit of shade. Because the last thing you wanna do is end up with a lot of dead needles. Now, the downside is we plant evergreens for greenery in the winter. So placement's really important, avoiding those Northwest winds or selecting plants that are more tolerant of winter wind and sun. Salt damage, I was just at the Dome's second uh, annual symposium on water quality. And the impact of de-icing salt is pretty incredible on our landscape. And those of you near the ocean have a salt spray from the ocean and it's hard on our plants. So here's a couple things to do. Shovel first and if needed, use plant-friendly de-icing salt. Because if we remove the snow before we salt, it's great. When we start salting snow, then that snow melts and it goes into our storm sewer. So shovel first, salt second, and use plant-friendly and concrete-friendly de-icing salt. Um, preventing winter damage, wind breaks and salt screens for evergreens. I mentioned this before, this is at um, our botanic garden in Milwaukee County. Uh, the gardens aren't open in the winter, so it doesn't matter that they've used the burlap to screen their U hedge. And then notice the wire around the trees. We'll talk about protecting trees from animal damage as well. Some people will even use hardware cloth and fill it with evergreen boughs, a little more decorative to protect evergreens and things. Winter mulch to prevent frost heaving. Frost heaving occurs when we have freezing and thaw thawing. So, you know, it gets cold, the soil freezes, we get a winter thaw, it thaws out, then it freezes again, and that freezing and thawing of the soil causes frost heaving. The shifting of the soil can actually push some plants out of the ground. Coral bells very subject to it. I found bulbs pushed out of the ground, daylilies, things like that. So the goal of winter mulch is to wait till the ground freezes because we're trying to keep it consistently cold. Cover it with straw or evergreen boughs. And for many of us, after Christmas is over, the holidays are over, cut those branches off your Christmas tree. Um, if you had a fresh cut Christmas tree and use that as mulch. Maybe um, talking to the place you buy your Christmas trees. Maybe they will be happy to sell you a bundle of those greens that you maybe use for decoration and some for winter mulch. The other benefit of waiting till the ground freezes is a lot of those animals have found somewhere else to winter. So we're not providing shelter right over a source of food. Then as temperatures are hovering in around and slightly above freezing or growth begins in spring, pull those evergreen branches off or that straw or marsh hay off your plants. And animals, 
uh, it was a great year for rabbits. I had a lot of rabbits in my property. Of course, I always have deer and every gardener I talked to had a lot of wildlife this year. And their feeding habits can change as the seasons change as well. So you know what, there's, these are arborvitae. Arborvitae are a favorite of deer. Uh, certain viburnums, I know the plants that they like in my landscape. So those are the ones I concentrate on, especially, particularly. So we wanna prevent the damage and a couple things we can do. Fencing, especially new plantings. This is basically hardware cloth. Before the ground freezes, sink it in several inches into the ground, four to six inches. So when the ground does freeze, um, and even if it doesn't freeze, you know those voles are busy eating seeds, looking for bark to eat. They're right at the soil surface. By sinking that hardware cloth, you make it more difficult. And if the ground freezes, impossible for them to get to that bark of that tree. At least four feet high, um, depending on your snow load, that will at least prevent some rabbit damage. You may need to go further up. And if deer are an issue, you might want to make that fencing a larger area so they can't reach and rub the trunk or, or chew on those branches. So we really want to protect those young trees and any of their favorites with fencing. Scare tactics may not be effective in urban and suburban areas. Um, they're pretty used to us. And if you try scare tactics, try it, move that, move that owl around, move that coyote around, move those scare tactics around because animals get used to seeing them in the same place and realize, oh, they're not going to bother me. Um, and then anything you do, make sure you monitor, make sure that fence stays intact. If you're using scare tactics, make sure that works. Repellents are another option as well. Homemade or products like plant skid. Um, apply before they start feeding and repeat as directed. One reason I like plant skid, it's rain and snow resistant, so I don't have to repeat as often. Um, it's odor based, so the odor discourages the animals. Um, I use it and it smells strong right after you spray, but I don't notice it, but the animals certainly do later on. And I mentioned that because when you've used odor-based repellents, sometimes they repel us a little longer than we want. But I find plant skid is effective and not obnoxious for us. The other thing is applying before they start feeding so you discourage them and send them elsewhere. The other reason to start applying early is you can retrain them. And then look for areas where they're entering your landscape. You may wanna treat those areas. So again, as they're coming in, they smell and they leave, whatever odor-based repellent you use. Some people use a handful of human hair and an old nylon stocking and report success. Some use stinky votive candles, the cheaper the better, they've told me. Some people have found cayenne pepper works well, sprinkled on the plants. One of my students, when I was teaching said, they used it at the golf course where I worked and they found the deer preferred the seasoned plants over the unseasoned plants. So whatever method, scare tactic, fencing, repellent to use, monitor throughout the season, adjust as needed, and maybe even consider using a combination of those. Rain barrels, hopefully a lot of you are, are using rain barrels and you wanna winterize them if you're in a cold climate when the temperatures fall below 40 degrees. You wanna get that rain barrel out of the cold weather conditions. So you're gonna to need to disconnect from the downspout and depending on your downspout or how you connect it to your rain barrel, you'll either reattach your downspout extension, you'll turn off the diverter, re-put the plug in so your downspout's active. Um, Milwaukee Metro Sewage District and Fresh Coast Guardians, there's links on your handout will help you winterize based on how you've hooked up your rain barrel. You want to remove any debris that might have collected on top of or inside and rinse it out. And then store it for the winter upside down in a garage, a shed, or your basement, depending on the space. Some people even store them outside upside down, but put a tarp over so that they last longer. Um, the plastic decomposes quicker when it's exposed to the cold temperature, and you don't want any water collecting, so elevating upside down under a tarp, but better yet, in a sheltered location.
How about any hardy plants that are in containers? So maybe you have some trees and shrubs and perennials that you have growing in a pot um, displayed in a container and you need to winterize them. So one option is to group these together if it's in a weather fruit proof pot. You can see I have a lot of things in plastic containers and some of these are plants I didn't get planted either in the garden. So they need to spend the winter outside before I get them planted in spring. So pushing them all together in a sheltered location. And then what two things you can do um, on the right these are all annual pots, things that are filled with soil. The plants are dead. I'm using those as insulation. And I eventually threw some wood chips over those as well. On the left, this was back in my home when I lived in Milwaukee. I had a very, very nice place. That's my garage, which was brick. My house was brick. My neighbor's house was brick. It was open to the north, but I would put all my containers together. Then I bagged my leaves, put those around. And then whenever we had snow, I threw it on top. So anything to insulate, maybe you have a fall display with bales of straw, use those, set those around to insulate. Maybe bags of mulch or potting mix or topsoil, set those around. The goal is to insulate the roots. If the top is hardy, it will be fine. It's the roots that can't take that cold temperature. They're used to being underground with all that insulation of a large swath of soil. You can heal them in, dig a trench, put the pots in the ground. That works very effectively. They're helping each other. This was a plant storage area I had when I moved from my old house and I just potted up a lot of my perennials that I brought with me, put them in a trench, put some wood chips over and it's amazing um, how well they did. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention is you can also move them into an unheated garage. And one of the things that you want to do is insulate. I'd throw a board on the ground, maybe uh, old carpets. I'd set the pots in my unheated garage, add some insulation, bags of shredded paper work very well, bags of potting mix, anything to insulate it, uh, non-biodegradable packing peanuts. I ended up building a little frame in my garage. I set all my pots and put my bags of shredded paper, water whenever the soil is thawed and dry and you'll have great success. One winter I had a vole move in and uh, spend the winter in the garage with my containers. Um, killed about half of them eating the bark and the roots. So now I treat with plants kit, it, it's rated for uh, controlling voles. I treat every pot with a little granular plant skid as I store them. And last winter I did not have that problem. What about overwintering non-hardy bulbs? And I put it in quotes because they may be a rhizome, a true bulb, a tuber, a corm, something. And cannas are probably the easiest. In general, and on your handout, there's more detail on storage, but um, in general, we wait for the tops to either yellow, in the case of glads, or die back with the light frost. That's for those of you where these are not hardy. Some of you may be tuning in and you can leave your cannas and your glads in the ground. But for those of us where they're not hardy, wait for the frost to kill them. Carefully dig them up, let them cure. And basically what we're doing is let any wounds close up and uh, over uh, close up. So cannas overnight, dahlias for a couple hours. We're putting them in a warm, dry location to cure. Glads take several weeks. Then we remove any of the remaining foliage. You might want to leave a little bit like an inch just to make it a little easier to manage. Gently brush off any excess soil. Don't scrub them like potatoes and store them. Some like cannas, dahlias, caladiums, tuberous begonia like to be covered when they're stored. Peat moss, sawdust. Um, uh, there was a, a excellent horticulturist who told me she buys the shredded cedar bedding for gerbils at the pet store and has a great success uh, storing her dahlias that way for many, many years. So that might be an option too, if you don't have access to the other. And then move them into a cool, dark location. And that's usually where the problem starts, right? They like to be stored 45, 55 degrees. And some of our basements aren't that cool. And so find the coolest location away from the furnace, maybe where two walls come together. I have an area where three walls um, are surrounded by soil where I store my wine 
and my non-hardy bulbs and it works great. So cannas, it's a great way to save them for next year. But then what about those mandevilla, hibiscus, and other tropical plants? Um, for hibiscus, the tropical hibiscus, if they're not hardy in your area, we're not talking the hardy ones with the dinner plate size flowers. These are the ones you may have displayed in a container. Bring them in, put them in a sunny window and grow them like a house plant. Um, I have a lot of people that take them to work and then it's hard for them to get them back for their garden because everybody's enjoyed the plant over winter. Um, they will go through a transition and I'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing you can do is put them in a cooler place with bright light and a cooler condition. They'll probably lose some of their leaves. They may bloom for you and then you'll have to water less often. They'll go sort of dormant, not totally, but somewhat dormant. Mandevias are wonderful plants. Um, I love to grow them in a sunny window and keep them going and blooming, but I've also had good luck putting them in the area where I've stored my dorm, uh, my non-hardy bulbs. I've left them in their container, put them there. I did minimal pruning back in mid-March. I brought them up into a sunny window, cut them back and fertilized and had great success. And that reminds me to tell you that with your hibiscus, finish any pruning you're going to do by the end of February so that you will get flowers in the summer versus fall and winter when you bring it back indoors. So grow it like a house plant, let it go dormant. Bananas, you can overwinter it like your canna. It's a rhizome, just like cannas are. So you can let it die back and overwinter. You can also grow it like a house plant. Uh, there are some hardy fiber bananas and they're hardy to zone five. And I've seen people keep those alive out in their garden, even in Wisconsin in a sheltered location, uh, mulching the soil when it freezes. I think Logies, L-O-G-E-E-S sold um, hardy bananas. If you go online and do an internet search, you may be able to find them at your garden center, but you may need to order online. But I did do an internet search and found several sites that were selling hardy bananas. These are not, but these make great house plants. You get a little bit of the tropics indoors, or again, treat them just like your cannas. If you want to push the limits, Dr. David Franco was a professor at Miami University, Miami of Ohio, which was a zone six area. I was lucky enough to interview him and this is his book. And he was able to overwinter palmettos, uh, bananas and some other plants typically you couldn't do using a special system that he devised special, um, he used uh, plastic um, kind of shelters and an open lid and just a variety of strategies for overwintering. So if you like to push the limits, you might wanna check out his book, The Library, It'd be a good place to find it. So I mentioned moving your plants indoors. If you're gonna treat them like house plants, who moves in with those plants? Insects quite often. And so you want to make sure that if possible, you isolate those plants for several weeks, keep them separate. So maybe you have a screened in porch or a room where you can keep them um, so that if there are insect problems, you can treat. I like to use organic things like insecticidal soap or summit year round spray oil, because if you have pets or kids or grandkids, it's a lot safer for them. You will need to repeat because they only kill what they touch, but check for couple of weeks and manage the insect pest. Yellow sticky traps are also very effective at managing those insects. If possible, put them in the sunniest window possible. Put those plants in the sunniest window that you have. If they can't stay there all winter, move them to the next sunniest location and keep continually gradually reducing the amount of sunlight until they're in their final location. That helps them acclimate so they lose fewer leaves, but it's very typical for them to have their leaves turn yellow and drop. And then they put out new leaves that are shade leaves. Those leaves are more efficient at absorbing whatever little light is available. The leaves from the summer were used to lots of light. And so the cells were arranged in a manner that blocked out some of that sunlight. And so when they were in low light, they didn't get enough light to maintain, so they dropped. 
So gradually acclimating them to their new home will help and managing the insects. I have a shop with a big window where my plants that go out for the summer go in there for the winter and my house plants and my house stay in year round to reduce the risk of insect problems. So I'm not bringing in insects, they're all in my shop so I can manage them all together. As always, I just want to remind you, if you're in the Wisconsin area, to call Diggers Hotline, no matter where you garden, Wisconsin, beyond, and Canada, call 811 at least three business days before putting the first shovel in the ground. Um, utility lines... Um, are buried, but the depth can change. It could be erosion. You may have had some work done. Uh, they may not have been installed at the, the depth that you were counting on. So always call, whether it's a trowel or shovel or a piece of um, heavy equipment, always call. It's a free service. They'll contact the, under, the utility uh, services. They'll providers will come out, mark any underground utilities in your work zone. It's for your own safety because you hit an underground utility. It can be in, you could have be injured or killed. Inconvenience, you hit the cable line, no one's happy with you, and it'll save you money because if you don't call in a timely manner or file online, you are responsible if you hit an underground utility for repairing it. And I'd much rather save my money for those plants. As always, I loved, I want to thank my sponsors, Milwaukee Metro Sewage District and Fresh Coast Guardians for sponsoring this webinar. Um, they've allowed me the opportunity to talk to you for this webinar and others in the past. So thanks to them for their support. And thanks also to the Milwaukee Public Library for sponsoring this event. Kelly and her team are wonderful. Visit your local library, support them. They're an important resource that we all benefit from. And with that, help me grow gardeners. Just a quick reminder, someone inspired you, inspire someone else. Whether it's a youngster in your life, a young family gardening for the first time, and if you're a new gardener, welcome. We're so glad to have you in our community of gardeners. Help inspire others because together we can grow a kinder and gentler world, one garden and gardener at a time. So my two little grandkids who aren't that aren't that little anymore, but digging in the soil is a great way to get kids in the garden and looking for bugs as well. Stay connected. All my information is on your handout. And now I'm ready for some questions, Kelly and Beth. Thank you so much, Melinda, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and thanks to everyone who is here this evening and sent in their questions to that Q&A box. Um, you'll find that button on the bottom of your screen. So let's get rolling here. And I want to also apologize in advance if any of the overhead announcements here play oh. during, you know, I'm at the library right now. So, um, so just a heads up on that, but here we go. So Dan says, I'm anxious about mulching near my home due to introducing bugs like stink bugs who will find a home in the decay and warm mulch. Any um, tips on or rather, I guess, any info on, is that a danger? Any any methods that people could use to yeah, good have question. That be a problem? Yeah. yeah, good question, Dan. So depending on where you live, carpenter ants and termites typically don't nest in shredded material. Carpenter ants attack decaying wood. Now, I'm not an expert on termites. So far, we're lucky that's not an issue. So if you're down south where termites are an issue, you're probably fumigating regularly and doing some of those things. So wood chips aren't a problem. Ground beetles, yes, will be in there. Other organisms that help to break it down. What you may choose to do is use a barrier of gravel around your house. And a lot of people in wildfire areas, that's one of the recommendations. I don't like gravel mulch under trees and shrubs because it doesn't improve our soil. Weed barrier, that black landscape fabric will keep the, the gravel from the stone mulch from going down into the soil and creating a nightmare. But you maybe you want to put a barrier of that around um, you know, a couple of feet and then use your organic mulches under your trees and shrubs. I've always mulched right up to my homes. Um, and I have, you know, my cement foundation. So I've got that, make sure the cracks are filled. I had an old house in Milwaukee and I had the rule that the centipedes could live in the basement, but they came upstairs, they were dead. And, um, you know, where I live now, mice are an issue. So I'm always looking for cracks in those little places they can get into. So you always want to make sure there are no ways for them to enter. That will help keep 
any of those insects out. Um, stink bugs are, and uh, box elder bee bugs, those things are a problem on plant material in general. So usually wood chip mulch are more of an issue with the things that are decomposing it, more of a nuisance than a problem. Again, if the carpenter ants are in your home, that means there's decaying wood maybe behind your dishwasher, behind the shower, under an eave. Take care of the rotting wood, you'll take care of the carpenter ants. And sometimes they wander in during a hot, dry summer looking for water, but if there's no decaying wood, they're, they're not gonna hang around. So good question, Dan, thank you for asking. The next question is from Maria. Um, Maria is asking, does lawn aeration interfere with tree roots? Good question. They're removing that, you know, the majority of the feeder roots are in the top 12 inches and the core aeration only is going down about three inches, um, two to three inches. And that's a great question. So some arborists, especially where soils are heavy, will even do what's called vertical mulching where they'll dig trenches radiate, radiating from outside the trunk of the tree and then filling it with compost to help improve aeration and drainage to the tree roots and heavier soil. So they're actually helping. And if you can possibly spread compost over the soil surface, just a quarter inch or so, over that soil surface after the soil's been aerated, that's even more beneficial because then you're getting organic matter down into the roots of not only the grass, but eventually into the tree roots. So it's just really shallow aeration. Great question. We're just opening up the roots where the grass is growing. So yeah, the tree roots will be out there, but um, it's such a minimal hole. Great question. Better than piling things over top and spreading a thin layer of compost over the grass after aeration will not hurt your tree either. Great question, Maria. So Liz is asking for using leaves as mulch for perennials. Is there any concern about having too many leaves on the perennials? Good question. And I forgot to mention, pull the leaves back from the crown of the plant. You know, when we're mulching, and I for all for also forgot to mention, pull the mulch back from the trunk of the tree, the stems of the shrubs. We want to pull that back because one, it makes easy access for voles. It creates a warm, dark environment, like I mentioned with the volcano mulching. So we want to pull that back. With leaves, if I like, I shred my leaves from the lawn, bag them up, and put them on the lawn. And the reason I, I or put them on the um, perennials, any extra leaves. And the reason I like to shred them is I find they link in together, but still let air and water through. Whole leaves, big leaves, like maple leaves and oak leaves often mat down, ice up for the winter. Um, look in the, in the woods, right, where the leaves drop down. And we don't have usually a very dense ground cover. We've got great soil. Um, so pull them off the crown of the plant and on the soil surface. And some people prefer to leave them intact, feel they provide uh, better homes for uh, pollinators. I feel like if I'm taking it off the lawn, um, I'm gonna collect it in my bag or, and then put it on the soil surface. So, you know, we don't wanna overdo mulch. Two to four inches of uh, wood chips, just a couple inches of leaves is usually sufficient. And just a reminder to everyone, um, we will send out the handout and also a link to the recording um, probably within a few days. Um, but uh, we also have a link to this handout in the chat as well if you want to access that today. But we will send that out all together in a, in a, a larger email. So you'll get that. Uh, a couple more questions on mulching here. I think we did talk about... Um, Let's see, uh, mulching over grass. Um, Similar, I think I think you said as long as you could see the grass and and the mulch, the leaves were broken up, then that was a good right. Indicator. The size of a quarter might help if you if you need kind of a you know something to compare it to. If your pieces are a size of a quarter or smaller, your grass will be fine. Good question. Always always helps to repeat. Somebody might have missed it, so thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. All right, question from Terry. Terry says, my sister-in-law bought a house with a large cluster of unkept Annabelle hydrangeas. They appear to have multiplied and grown outside the planting bed and are very floppy. How would you recommend pruning them? And can branches that have extended out past the beds be dug out without harming the shrubs? 
Good question. And I think it's almost time to do another webinar on hydrangeas. I did one last Saturday in person. So this is a great question. So a couple things you can do. If you've got rooted stems growing out of the bed, you can take a sharp spade and cut down its hard or a reciprocating saw to cut through the roots or your loppers and dig a chunk, almost like you were digging a piece of a perennial out. And you can either compost that or try planting it in another location. Sometimes those long branches do what's called layering. So they'll lay on the ground, form roots where they touch the soil. You can cut that stem between the root system of the main shrub and where it rooted, then you have a newly rooted shrub, you can move to another location. So yes, you can dig up and reduce the diameter of that. The time to prune your hydrangeas is anytime they're dormant. I like to leave them up because I like to look at those dried flowers. To me, that's winter interest, but a lot of people find it messy. And one way to, to reduce floppiness is to cut all the stems back to between 15 to 18 inches, then take half of those right back to the ground. The older stems help support the new growth in spring, and then you it reduces the floppiness. So um, she may need to do a little dividing to kind of contain them if she doesn't want to expand her bed. And then proper pruning any time before growth when the plant's dormant, goes dormant in the fall to before growth begins in the spring. The other reason I like late winter, early spring pruning is if we've had snow damage, ice damage, animals, animal damage to our shrubs, we can take care of cleaning that up when we do our pruning. So it's one shot versus pruning now and then pruning later. So wait for it to go dormant. She can do the pruning, that will help. And that's also a good time if she's gonna take down out some of that excess on the edges. Question from Diane. Diane says, I live north of Madison, um, okay. Wisconsin in zone 5B, and wanted to know about canna bulbs. Do I need to dig those up and store in peat moss over the winter? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Diane. We are, we, it's a little, they're like a zone seven, eight. So I should have mentioned that when I was talking canna. So thanks for asking. I have had a couple of people um, near the lake, Lake Michigan in a very sheltered location say they had some glads make it. I've had a few people say their callas have made it. But if you really wanna make sure they come back, you wanna dig them up after the tops die back. On the handouts, a lot more detail about how to overwinter those non-hardy bulbs. And yes, unfortunately for us, pretty much all of those cannas, caladiums, uh, calla lilies, glads, um, they all need to come up and be stored in, uh, indoors for winter in a cool, dark location. Reese would like to know, is it too late to start repairing your grass with seed? No, actually, I think we're finally, depending on where you live, um, we typically say end of August to the like third week in September for those of us in the northern climate. Um, and we've had, you know, we're finally getting some rains in my neck of the wood, thank goodness. Um, and there's still time. You want to get it in soon because the last thing you want to happen, it takes about three weeks for that seed to sprout. That soil's warm, that's a good thing. Air's cool, less stressful. So it's going to sprout a little faster. But we want to get it sprouted and growing so that if we get a hard freeze on those tender seedlings, it tends to kill them. The other option is to do what's called dormant seeding. It's a little risky and tricky but you wait until the soils, um, until we've had several hard frosts, but the ground isn't frozen, spreading the grass seed. And the idea there is it sits there just as if it was naturally seeding in. And then in spring, as the soil warms, we get some rain, that seed sprouts. You'll be out of luck with time and a little bit of money on your grass seed if it doesn't work, but it's a way to, to kind of push the season if you don't get it in this month yet, but sooner rather than later is better. And just a reminder to everyone, we will share that handout um, in an email along with a, a link to the video recording that you just watched this evening as well. So we will send that along. A uh, question from Susan, uh, aerating versus detaching the lawn, which is more important? Great question. Um, dethatching takes um, finger like 
blades or um, spokes that reach in and pull the thatch layer out. It's very stressful on the lawn and the gardener, I think, because after you dethatch your lawn, it's, whoa, it's, it's, it's a very scary thing. Compost that thatch, though, that you pull off the lawn, that's great organic matter. So don't throw it in the garbage, compost it. That's a good time to overseed, um, overseeding after aeration or dethatching, because when you dethatch, you've opened up a lot of the lawn. Um, aeration is less stressful. Um, it's better for compacted soil. So if you have heavy clay compacted soil, you'll want to aerate and that will help with your thatch problem. Dethatching um, a half inch or less of thatch is an okay thing. It acts like a mulch more than a half an inch. Um, then you're going to want to remove that. Thatch, for those of you who remember old jute backings of carpet in the old day, that's what it reminds me of. It's dead, old, dead grass material. And it didn't have enough contact with the soil to decompose because your lawn was too dense. And so what happens is the thatch builds up, your lawn thins out, so we need to physically removing it. So avoid over fertilizing. Um, grass clippings don't cause thatch, but if they're long, run over them with a mower so they break down more quickly. So it's really a thick, dense lawn that's been heavily fertilized is more subject to thatch buildup. So if you have a thick thatch layer and you want to um, overseed this fall, that would be a good thing to do. Aeration will help somewhat with the thatch, but even more importantly with compacted soil. So Margaret would like to know, can you list plant and sidewalk friendly de-icing products? And I, I wonder if this would be helpful to add to that email that we can send out to yes, everybody. I will do that. And here's one of the other scary things I learned that it's usually something that's magnesium chloride instead of sodium chloride that is used. So they're usually sold as plant friendly. And I will add, I'll give you a list of those. I'll, I'll get that to you, Kelly. I'll do that right away and add that to the list because I think that'd be helpful for everyone. But they're even finding that there's some problems with the magnesium causing buildup. So in the chlorine, and I should say not magnesium, the chlorine in the water is becoming an issue. So it's a magnesium chloride so that it doesn't have the sodium. So it doesn't have the salt, so it's friendlier to the plants, but then we're seeing some chlorine building up in our water as well. There is some research going on with using alternatives. Um, some municipalities are brining, so they add water to their de-icing salts and putting it down so it, it's a slurry and as apparently requires less material to be effective. I know there's been some research on using beet juice, believe it or not, some vegetable juices, trying to find alternatives that are a little more organic. I know some municipalities have used sand, but I've always been concerned that that sand ends up going into our storm sewers too and, you know, building up uh, material there. So I will put, thank you, Kelly, that's a great suggestion. I'll put a list together on uh, some of those more plant-friendly de-icing salts. I'm going to make myself a note so I don't forget to do that. Thanks for asking. Great question. All right. So we've got, I'm um, seeing two questions about buckthorn. So oh. Just bundled them here. Um, Cam from Brookfield asks, when should I move a fire line buckthorn? Oh. It's large, but the previous owners put it too close to the house on the west side. Wondering if fall or spring would be best. And then Mary would like to know any advice on getting rid of buckthorn. <laughs> Exactly. I thought that's what it'd be. So fine line buckthorn is supposed to be sterile. So we won't. So um, moving any shrub after it's dormant, so after it goes dormant this fall, is a great time because the roots continue to grow until the ground goes solid. So you could do it this fall. The soil is warm, as I mentioned. The air is cool. A lot easier for you. Or you can do it in spring before growth begins. Now, this year, you know, the last two summers have been really hot and dry, so it's really hot. It's really hard. I mean, I used to be a spring. Spring is the best time because winter is harsh on our plants, but now we're finding the stress of summer is pretty tough. So you want to get those plants moved at least, you know, six weeks before either winter weather sets in or hot summer weather sets in and when the plants are dormant. So you could do it this fall as soon as the leaves drop. Buckthorn tends to stay, hold its leaves later in the season. 
So you may opt to do it in the spring before it leaves out and it's, it'll leaf out early. So you'll have a lot longer and it's a pretty tough plant. So that's the fine line buckthorn. For common and glossy buckthorn, they are um, listed as invasive and getting rid of them. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has great information on treatment. So fall is a great time. They're easy to find in the fall. They hold their leaves longer. We're gonna do, actually, we're in the process of doing a video for the Department of Natural Resources to help with identification. So buckthorn honeysuckle fall is a great time. A um, couple things you can do. Small ones, you can dig out, try to dig out if they're less than an inch in diameter. Those that are less than six inches in diameter, you can either strip the bark off or use a total vegetation, a brush killer, and paint the bottom 12 inches of that trunk, and that kills it and girdles the plant and eventually kills it. Or you can cut the plant back at ground level and treat the stump with um, a Roundup type product. Um, or a stump uh, brush killer product. I have some I need to tackle this fall and winter as well. And so the idea is if you just cut it back, it's gonna grow back. So you need to either remove the roots by digging or treat the stump or the trunk so you kill the roots and the top of the tree. Fall is a great time to do that. And the, if, and the Department of Natural Resources website can be challenging. So I usually do WIDNR, Buckthorn, and that'll get you right to that page, or WDINR honeysuckle. And then once you get into their invasive species and do a search, it tells you how to identify great pictures, great information on control, and the impact they have on the environment. So great question. Thanks for asking. Right. Um, Miriam shares, we have had throngs of box elder bugs in our yard this year. Oh. Do you have any recommendations for deterring them? Spraying with a weak solution of dish soap and water does seem to kill them, but it's so overwhelming to find and spray them. Good question. So box elder bugs feed on the seeds of maples and box elders are a type of maple. They usually gather on the south side of the house and on cooler days where it's nice and warm. And then that's how they heat up. And so she's right. You can use um, like a, a uh, laundry detergent, you can use uh, soap, you can use a horticulture oil, test it on your siding. Some people who have sprayed year after year say that side of their house is a little cleaner and lighter than the rest of the house. Uh, vacuuming is an option, but pretty putsy. And then you got to dump those into, you know, like a shop vac that you can suck them up off the wall, maybe put soapy water into the container where they're being dumped so that you kill them right away. Um, those are kind of the eco-friendly uh, insecticides will work. As I mentioned, um, horticulture oil is organic. It kills them by uh, covering them, insecticidal soap, the laundry detergent technique. If you use synthetic uh, insecticides, read and follow label direction of organic, synthetic, any kind of insecticide you use. So yeah, it is putsy. In some years, I think with the hot, dry weather, we're going to be seeing a lot of those. And I started seeing a fair number of stink bugs out in my garden too this year. So I think we're in for a little, little bit of insect management. Question from Dorothy. Dorothy says, my neighbor used Garland 4 to treat oh. ash tree sprouters that were popping up in their yard. They removed this tree and the, re the roots kept producing. I have a red maple that is about 15 feet from where they were applying the solution. Now my tree that should be full of leaves and full of color is looking like it's the middle of winter. Any suggestions or thoughts on that? So hopefully they just, I don't think, well, ash trees and maple tree roots should not have grafted because that is a concern when we're treating for oak wilt because you've got to be careful when you remove an oak wilt tree because they do graft one oak tree to another. So that shouldn't be a problem. Hopefully they applied carefully so you didn't get wash out from you know, their application or any vapor if they applied it when it was hot. So I'm it may not be the garland. It may not be the garland. That, unless it was misapplied or some environmental factors influencing treat affecting your plant. If it is a true red maple, true red maples have green leaves in the summer, red leaves in the fall. 
Often we call the purple or red leaf Norway maples, bigger leaves that are reddish purple all season red maples. So the true red maple needs acidic soil. So depending on where you live, if you're in southern part of Wisconsin, our soils or other areas with high pH or alkaline soils, it ties up the iron and manganese that the true red maple needs to have good green growth. And if they don't get the iron and manganese, the leaves are pale green, the veins stay dark, they may dry up. The other thing is make sure your trees receive sufficient moisture. Um, last winter was hard on a lot of our plants. Remember back in November, we had warm weather and then down to 19 degrees, at least in my yard. And those trees didn't have a, a, enough time to really harden enough. 19 degrees in the middle of winter is easier for a plant to take than when it transitions from 40 to 19. And so a lot of our plants, I had a few things that I had die back on, some plants that didn't make it. The other thing that happened is it got warm and then it got cold and then it got warm and then it got cold. And many of us didn't have much snow cover. And so that was really hard on our plants. So it could be a combination might not be the problem with the garland. It could be a problem with last winter, the hot, dry summer, and if it is a true red maple. Um, I would think your neighbor's sprouts wouldn't be coming up if uh, that garland had transferred into your garden area. And hopefully there were no suckers from your maple roots coming up. So let's hope it wasn't the garland and hopefully your tree will come back next year if it had enough time to put leaves on for the summer. Make sure the soil is well watered before the ground freezes this fall. Cool questions from um... Folks wondering about, is it too late to plant a couple things? So um, Sharon would like to know, is it too late to plant a hibiscus and how to determine proper depth for that? It was bought in the spring, um, not tropical. And Jeannie's wondering, is it too late to plant evergreens? Okay, great questions. And I hope it's not too late because I have a lot of things I'm planning on planting. <laughs> so evergreens, we'd like to get in in the north. If you're in the north, we like to get in by October 1st, if possible. Again, the soil's nice and warm. Those plants have time to put down roots. Um, some nurseries and landscapers will do uh, dormant a frozen root ball transferring of evergreens, believe it or not, digging the root ball, letting it freeze and moving during the dorm season, but we don't wanna do that. So planting your evergreens, if possible, by October 1st. Perennials and shrubs and other trees, you got, you depending on where you live, you wanna get them in as soon as you can, um, before or right after uh, the trees and shrubs go dormant. I've I've planted some things pretty late in the season and had luck. Mulching helps insulate the soil. So if you plant mulch the soil surface, that's gonna keep the soil warmer later. So those roots will continue to be established. So uh, depending on you where you live, unless you're in the far north, you still have time to do some planting. Again, the soil's warm, the air's cool. I think we all need to get busy in the next couple of weeks to get some things in the ground. I know I do. All right. See, Dan is wondering, does plant skid work on squirrels? Yes, it does. So plant skid is, works on deer, moose, and elk. And the liquid is a good formulation for them because you can treat higher where they tend to feed. So that smell is by their nose. Um, the granules also help if they're reaching down to eat your hostas or nibbling on low growing plants. Um, it also works, both formulations work on voles, chipmunks and squirrels and rabbits. Um, not so much on ground squirrels. Um, I've had some success, but they don't guarantee it on groundhogs and ground squirrels because ground squirrels eat not only plants, but insects and small rodents and all kinds of things. So it's harder to keep them away and the same with the groundhogs, but voles, chipmunk squirrels. So squirrels, it's a great option for, um, you know, where they're doing the digging, you know, that granular will work in your containers this year. I was sprinkling plant skid granules in all my pots because uh, the squirrels were doing a lot of digging in the chipmunks as well. So yes. Um, and check out their website. I think there's a link in your handout to their website if you want more information on that. 
Question from Janice. Janice uh, says that they've had Minarda raspberry wine in the yard for three summers. Uh, this year's the first that um, they've had powdery mildew. Uh, usually leave perennials standing for the winter interest and clean up in the spring. Would cutting it back help reduce or avoid powdery mildew? You know what, and here, this was a great year for powdery mildew. My field bindweed weeds even had powdery mildew. That's how bad powdery mildew was this year. And I saw some resistant plants like raspberry wine are resistant, not immune. So that would be one I would definitely cut back and clean up this fall, just because it tends to be a resistant plant. So less, less source of the disease. I have some bee balm out away from my house, kind of in an area where it doesn't bother me, the powdery mildew, because it's kind of a wild area. So I just leave them stand. But if I, I have a couple of cherry bomb, bee bombs and a new garden planting, and that's the only thing with powdery mildew. So I'll probably cut those back and leave everything else standing. That's one of those things that the plant pathologist would say, cut them back and get rid of anything with powdery mildew or any, and this is one of those where you may say, oh, here, I'll leave it go, but here, I'll take care of it. May is asking, uh, or says, I'd like to cut down my lilacs. They're about 10 feet tall. Thank you. Now, oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you for visiting the special library. Sorry about that. Um, let me start over. May is asking, um, or saying, uh, they'd like to cut down their lilacs. They're about 10 feet tall and have very few flowers. Can I cut them down this fall uh, to about two to three inches tall or suggestions on, on cutting back? Great. And I think my how to prune shrubs is still on my website. And I'm going to answer your question, May, but just in case, because I think, you know, we'll end and you'll go, what did she say? So here's what I recommend. When we take big shrubs like that back to just a few inches, yes, your lilac will probably be fine. All that stored energy and the roots pushes up. And sometimes you end up with a plant bigger than you started with. I've seen forsythia cut back that were eight feet tall and the next year they were 12. If you can tolerate it, um, cut back some of the stems back to ground level or as close as you can and then reduce the height by several feet. And then do this for several years in a row and you will bring the size down. Now, the problem is timing. If you prune it during the dormant season, any time but right after flowering, you're eliminating some, if not all of the flowering wood. So if you cut that plant back to two or three inches over winter, you're gonna have no flowers. If you take out a few stems right back to the ground level, let it bloom, then reduce the height on what's left, you'll have some flowers and you can reduce the height by a third. Then do that again next spring, take some of the stems back or in the next dormant season, take some of those bigger stems back to the ground and if needed, reduce the height of any remaining stems after flowering. At the end of three years, you're gonna have a much smaller plant and then just occasionally remove those stems as needed to keep it smaller. But they said their flower buds are set for next year. The same with forsythia, bridal respirea, they bloom on new growth. And so, or I mean, sorry, they bloom on old growth, they bloom on old growth. And so their flower buds are set to bloom next spring. Things like summer blooming spirea, um, Annabelle hydrangea, panicle hydrangea, they put out new growth and form flower buds in the spring to flower for you in the summer or fall. So those can be pruned during the dormant season. And so can others, but you're removing some, if not all of the flowering wood on lilac, forsythia, Wygela's big push, mock oranges, all have formed their flower buds already for next spring's flowering. Question from Dan that um, I think will be a good reminder for everyone here as well. Dan's asking, should I cover my outdoor flower pots of perennials for the winter? Yes. So a couple of things that you want to do. So if the if if your contain if your perennials are in a weatherproof pot and they're one zone hardier, there's a good chance they'll survive. If they aren't in a weatherproof pot, 
Um, then you're going to want to bring them into a shed, an unheated garage, um, throw some insulation around the roots, water whenever the roots are thawed and dry. A lot of times I grow perennials, trees and shrubs that I'm going to display on my patio, but not leave out year round in a nursery pot. You can pick them up at the garden center. You may have some. Then I set that nursery pot you know, the ones that they grow shrubs and trees in inside my pretty pot. So in the fall, I can take that plant out, either bury the pot in a vacant part of the garden or um, move it into my unheated garage or put it out in a sheltered location and surround the pot with something insulated. But Terracotta pots absorb moisture. When water freezes, it, it expands and will crack your terracotta pot. Same with glazed pots. When that soil that's moist freezes, it expands, can crack your glazed pot. Some people insulate their glazed pots. If you have to leave the pots empty, um, empty them, turn them upside down, cover them with a tarp, and I'd place them on a board or elevate them above the ground, maybe an old pallet if you can find one, so that they don't freeze to the soil and you don't have that soil impacting. If possible, move those to a place where they won't get wet. So you need to insulate the roots if there are perennials in there, and depending on the type of pot uh, influences and what you have available to for space for overwintering. Question from Mary. Uh, Mary's asking for any tips to control white flies. It's been a tough year. Um, seven uh, S E V I N did not help much. So I'm not a huge fan of seven because it's so hard on bees and I get it. White fly are tough. And here's the deal with white fly. They have a very um, short lifespan. So using a resmethrin or permethrin, a lower toxicity, you still want to be careful with the bees. You make three applications five days apart because what happens is they'll kill different stages, but you've got eggs coming up and it won't kill the eggs. Horticulture oil will suffocate the eggs um, and nymphs, but it has to cover the insects. So you'll need to repeat that regularly as well, but that's an organic option. When, if it's a plant you're bringing inside, again, I'll make sure you have good airflow if you're gonna use resmethrin or permethrin to treat. Um, some people will use the horticulture oil repeating um, so that you eventually take care of them. And yellow sticky traps won't, kill them all, but it will trap a lot of them. And that's a great way when you're bringing plants indoors, a yellow sticky trap stuck in the pot helps with fungus gnats, help with white fly. Um, any insect that flies will stick to it inside, not outside, because you don't want birds going after the insects on the yellow sticky trap and getting stuck. So if it's an indoor problem, try the yellow sticky traps. If you use an insecticide, make sure you have good air ventilation, check the label outside if you're in a milder if you're in a mild climate they will overwinter and i'm guessing maybe you are if you're here in wisconsin the white flies will die on the plants outside it's just when we bring those plants inside that we have problems that they keep they make it over winter so if you're in a cold climate and they're outside they'll eventually die with a hard frost inside try the sticky traps maybe something organic um, usually if we can manage the population and keep the plants healthy, we'll probably have some, but not enough to really um, kill our plants. Just, you know, managing the population, not extinguishing it. Okay, so we're going to just have a couple minutes here. Um, let's see if we can get these last few questions. Jeannie's asking, um, I have several clematis that turn brown on some of their branches. Are they still okay? Yeah, it's probably, I'm guessing it's stem wilt. And stem wilt kills the stems, they turn brown or black. And it's hard to remove the infected stems when the plant's growing because they're all intertwined. So one of the best things you can do is cut it back and get rid of that. And sometimes that's enough. It doesn't kill the plant. It's a crown wilt really is what they should call it. The crown is fine. The crown of the plant survives. Now, depending on where you live, the early blooming clematis, they flower very early and they've set their flower buds, but you may have to make a choice. You know, maybe after they bloom, you'll cut it back. Um, you're spending some of that energy that's been in, you know, put out in leaves. 
most of us in northern climates anyway, our clematis bloom in summer or fall. So they bloom on new growth. So cutting them back in fall, getting rid of that debris. If that isn't sufficient, you may want to try to break the cycle and use a copper containing fungicide and then follow directions. But that says growth begins in the spring and makes several applications. Fungicides protect plants. They don't cure what's infected in general. So you're going, okay, I've had the problem in the past. I think I'm probably going to get it again. I'm going to treat. Or you may want to try clean up in the fall and see if that's sufficient. And the good news is your plant will survive if it truly is stem wilt. Lynn is asking, do I fertilize fall planted shrubs and conifers? Great question. Um, with new plantings, really it's best to wait a year um, before you fertilize. Let them have some time to put their roots down. You'll also get the greatest benefit. Um, if you are if you feel you need to fertilize, wait until the plant's dormant. Better yet, wait until spring. Otherwise, give those plants a chance to get established before you start fertilizing, giving them a good year. So if you plant this fall, next spring, or next fall after they're dormant, okay, but not late in the season. And that's also when the roots are actively growing, so you'll get the biggest benefit. So no fertilizer this fall, for sure. We wanna stop fertilizing in the North by August 1st. Question from Elaine. Elaine wants to know, um, or is sharing that uh, they have thistle plants growing all over a section of their lawn. Oh. How can I get rid of them? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> You could spot treat, uh, you know, if you're doing, mowing is one way to help, though I've had a few thistles bloom in pretty, pretty short. I grow, we cut our grass to like four and a half inches tall and I, there's a few thistles blooming. You could spot treat with a broadleaf weed killer. Um, that can help um, in the lawn area. Uh, that's probably your best option. I don't like to use weed and feeds because the fertilizer needs and the weed killer needs and timing are usually off a little bit. So fertilizing separately and then using a liquid uh, weed killer where you can spot treat, you use less product. You could be very targeted in your approach. You'll save money and better for the environment. And uh, you may take apl several applications and all those seeds in the ground will sprout. So it can take you a few years. Keeping your lawn healthy will also help reduce weed problems as well. Would you say the same thing for getting rid of pokeweed, Leslie, would like to know? Oh, yeah, pokeweed. And boy, the birds spread it. And that's probably going to be more of an issue in your landscape, I'm guessing. Um, in your garden beds, do not use broadleaf weed killers. So with pokeweed, if you can dig, if you can continually cut it back when you find it, though I know it's pretty sneaky. And the next thing you know, there's berries and the birds are spreading them. Um, but if you can dig up the roots, if you can continually cut it back when you find it to starve it to death or spot treat, if you don't mind using glyphosate, either Roundup or Finale, Finale has a different mode of action. Um, what I'll often do is when I cut back the weeds, when they re-sprout, I take a milk jug or soda, two liter soda bottle, cut off the bottom, set it over the weed spray so that the um, weed killer, the total vegetation killer gets on those leaves. It's absorbed through the leaves into the roots, but I protect the nearby plants. And then I let it drip dry because of a wet, treated wet leaf touches your desirable plant or the spray touches your desirable plant, it can injure it or even kill it because it is a total vegetation killer. But sometimes taking care of some of those invasive plants that are hard to control, you know, digging is one way, cutting back, and then you may decide that you need to, to do the, you know, treatment spot treated. In the lawn, we don't typically spot treat with Roundup because it would kill your grass and you could use a broadleaf weed killer there. One more question about weeds. Uh, Terry would like to know how to kill bindweed. Um, oh. Killing it every week. Oh, you're doing better than me, Terry. I tell you, I took some pictures of bindweed for a webinar, and Dawn, who helps me put these together, I give her the content and images. She makes them beautiful. She goes, "Oh, we have that, and from the year before, and from the year before." So, digging the roots are very deep. They can go down to nine feet tall. Um, cutting it back. And then this again, may be one that you need, you may decide to spot treat with a total vegetation killer um, in the garden, in the lawn. You know, it's kind of hard to 
wipe it on and not treat the grass. And usually your grass can kind of hold its own as long as you maybe fertilize this fall, you'll be amazed. One fertilization, leaving your grass clippings on can reduce weeds by as much as 50%. So fertilizing your lawn, leaving the clippings on, and then in the garden, um, spot treating or using that milk jug uh, tip to, to protect the good plants, but kill the bindweed. Otherwise, I think I read somewhere that you have to cut it back every four weeks. You're out there every day. There's so much, you miss one plant, it comes in through your juniper, right? Or your pine tree. I'm, I'm battling that as well. So I will think of you as I'm digging mine. It's, it's winning right now. I might have to use some total vegetation killer because so far my digging has not kept it in bounds. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for all of your great questions. Yes, um, thank and you. especially thanks to Melinda for hanging out a little bit later and answering the questions and, and again, sharing such a great presentation with everyone. Um, I hope that um, everyone finds this useful and you'll be able to rewatch it again when we send out our email with the video link as well as Melinda's handout. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, thank you, Melinda, so much again for um, being with us and for sharing all of your expertise um, so generously. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. And thanks to everyone watching. And if you have topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know. Info at melindamyers.com. I know Kelly at the library, they always, you know, share with your library and they'll get the word back to us as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Right. So again, we'll send that email out probably within a few days. Um, thanks so much. And we hope you have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Bye now.